welcome to the Bodies Built Better podcast. I'm your host, Jackie Tan, and I'm so happy you're joining me today. This show is all about human performance. I chat with athletes, coaches, scientists, and health experts from all over the world to give you the best tips, tools, and strategies to help you feel your best and discover your extraordinary potential. And today's episode, the ultimate tips episode. These are the biggest, the bestest, the greatest. Need you in my life right now. Tools, tips, and strategies from every episode from season three. All in one place right here. Well, actually, it's two places because this is part one and you'll hear part two next week. And I thought it would be such a great way to compile all the amazing advice from elite athletes, coaches, and health experts from all over the world in one place. And if you missed an episode and loved the advice from a particular guest that you missed and you're like, that was really awesome, I'm going to try that. And then you listen to the rest of the episode for more awesomeness, then, then you have the opportunity to do that as well. So To get us started, the first guest of 2022 was Ultraman world champion Richard Thompson. Now, if you don't know about the incredible challenge Richard has set himself and his team this year, in May at the Ultraman Australia in Noosa, Richard will be attempting to break a sub-20 Ultraman. Now, to give you some context as to how incredible this is, Let me give you a breakdown of the course. So it's a three-day event. First day is a 10-kilometer swim. Second day is a 42-point... 42, my bad. It's not at all, like times that by 100. It's a 421.1-kilometer bike ride. And day three is an 84.3-kilometer run. Yeah. (laughs) Now, after setting a new Ultraman world record in 2017 with a time of 21 hours and 21 minutes, he is now attempting to achieve the impossible. Richard wants to take a full 90 minutes off his current world record and achieve a sub-20 hour Ultraman. In this episode, we talk about vulnerability and how that's playing a major role in becoming an even better athlete, sharing the mindset shifts, addressing self-doubt, lack of motivation, and ultimately failure. What is one strategy that people can use when they're in the hurt locker, so to speak? So whether it's a seven-hour ride, a five-hour run, whatever it is, they're, they're struggling, they want to quit. What is your best advice for them in that moment? The mantra that I lead to, that I lean on is um, this is where you want to be. And it's to remind myself that it's the, it's in the discomfort that creates the currency or the value of the experience. And so going back to that lady who was could walk the marathon you can walk a marathon but if that's that's not if that's not if that's not if that's really comfortable for you you're not going to get a lot out of it and so as soon as you realize that in anything that you do the value of that experience is directly related to the discomfort or the sacrifice then you open your eyes and you realize that that hurt locker or that discomfort is exactly what you want because that's providing the experience and the, the, the richness to that experience. Oh, that's so powerful. So it's almost like we're chasing discomfort. We have to be. We are. And the, the idea of discomfort in a lot of people's mind is a negative, but that's only because that's how society is looking at it. That's how you've been yeah. programmed it. But if you look at it as an actual like sacrifice or, or discomfort as a positive, if you tell me anything that you've achieved in your life, Jackie, that, hasn't come from sacrifice or discomfort, you're not going to find much because yeah. it's not, it's not valuable to you. Exactly. So when, so when you are in that position, whether it's cycling, running, whether it's, you know, doing that last brief for your boss or whatever it is, there's value in it. And therefore you need to look at it and go, yeah, I'm here. This is exactly where I want to be because this creates the value of the experience. 
Here I talked to the incredible Genevieve Gregson, who back in the 2020 Tokyo Olympics ruptured her Achilles tendon in the women's 3,000-meter steeplechase final. And at the time of the interview, she was 32 weeks pregnant. And we had such a wonderful chat about her career, her setbacks and injuries, the pressure of being not only an elite athlete, but a female elite athlete and what that means for sponsorships, especially when you're thinking about starting a family and what the future holds for her. For those out there who may be injured and feel like they're constantly battling something as a niggle, what's your message to them and, and how can they manage, I guess, both both the physical and the mental mm-hmm. side of things? I mean, kind of like what I said earlier, if if I can give you any tips that I've used my whole career, it's, you know, a step process. Uh, it won't get better overnight, you know, which I learned back in college. And it's about kind of accepting where you are and not turning things into a negative. Like you're, if you're in a bad place, it's, it's really hard to get out of at the best of times. So I would say sit there, accept your situation, grieve if you have to, but, Um, set a new goal and start planning how to move forward um, and go easy on yourself. I'd be the first to admit that there's been times where I've almost punished myself for being hurt and made training so hard. And it's like I cross train like a crazy person. Um, And then after a few weeks, I'm so exhausted and, and in a bad place mentally that, you know, I feel like I've actually taken steps backwards be kind to yourself, make a sustainable plan that you can see yourself doing indefinitely for a long time and um, find the positives in your environment. I mean, I'll be the first to admit I'm good at having a pity party and finding out all the negatives and thinking that it's poor me and I'm the victim. But um, once you can kind of switch adversity into a new opportunity, uh, it can open so many doors. And I've, I'm, real life experience on that. I mean, rupturing my Achilles, I could have told you at the time was the worst thing that could have ever happened. But looking back now uh, and where I've come and, and what I have planned, it it was a door opening in my career. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm blessed that I ruptured my Achilles on the last barrier. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy to think like that, isn't it? But when you do look back <clears throat> and try and be positive, it does open up your mind to other opportunities out yeah. there. And adversity, it creates character. Like you, yeah. you learn to deal with hard things. If, if things were easy all the time, like you're just never learning and you're never really equipped with what you need to have when things get tough. And I do believe that whatever life throws at me, it, it's going to get hard and, and there'll be plenty of more stories in my career from here where I think this is the worst thing that's happened, but I just know that I'll be able to move forward from it just from what I've learned so far. And adversity is only going to help you deal with what's ahead in life. So hopefully you're able to deal with it then and there and, and make a plan and move forward. Now, being a remedial massage therapist, I'm commonly asked what treatment someone should get when they feel tension in their shoulders or if they're getting headaches and so many other iterations of these sorts of questions. So I decided to chat with another expert in this field, Sean Brewster, who is the founder and clinical director of Advanced Clinical Education. And we chat about the science behind massage, cupping and dry needling, why these treatments work, what they do, when you should get treatment and when you shouldn't. Check this one out. As someone wanting to get a treatment out there, what is your best advice to them when they're trying to decide what sort of treatment to be getting? Yeah, right. I would say um, ask somebody who is in the same demographic as you who they see. So if you're a an older person with aches and pains, ask another older person with aches and pains. Don't ask a young grandson who's a high-level athlete who they're going to see, right? It's, you have to, it's all things in context. And so uh, it's not even which which modality the person should see, it's which practitioner. Because like I said at the start, everyone has their own focus, their own bias. You know, both you and I were trained in massage. I can guarantee we'll have different ways in which, the way we treat. So I would say ask for a recommendation from a peer in a similar kind of demographic set about who they see and what benefits they get and then follow that. 
Self-care has been at the center of the well-being conversation for the past couple of years now and for good reason. Part of this is understanding your vagus nerve and the role it plays in your health and how the connection between your brain and nervous system via the vagus nerve is the key to your emotional, physical, and psychological well-being. In this episode, Jessica explains what the vagus nerve is, why it's important, and how to identify if you need to be nurturing your vagus nerve. What is one action people can take to nurture their vagus nerve? So you probably heard me say this so many times, but I would just say to you know, lean into those people who are in that regulated state when you're having a a challenging time. I think that's the biggest part that will actually restore that sense of of safety and can, um, with the reciprocity, like the back and forth Mm -hmm. in communication or care or, um, you know, giving and receiving care, that is enough to often shift our state so easily and so beautifully without you know, feeling that we've got to do it all on our own. The easiest type of training you could start right now is running in the sense that all you need is you. But what happens if you're frequently getting niggles or you're trying to get faster, but nothing seems to be changing or improving? Well, run coach Paul McKinnon has some awesome tips about how you can become aware of what you're doing and some things you could look out for in your running. So if there's anything or any um, technique tips that you could give people right now to do, they're just about to go for their run, what's something they can think about as they go for their run? Uh, Look, I'd always go with um, try and get some perception of what you're doing first. You know, like ask yourself, like do a systems check. What does it feel like? Is it in time? Something as simple as like, and, and let that kind of feed into probably the next bit, but do a systems check. What does it feel like? Am I making the same movements? What position do I feel like? Am I feeling stress? Or where do I, where am I holding stress? Um, and then something as simple as at least if I can run evenly left and right, even if it's a really poor movement, if I can at least load and move similarly or the same with some semblance of symmetry left and right, and in time, and even timing, it's a good start. Um, it's somewhere that they can go, okay, well, at least I'm, at least I'm even left and right. Because as I said right at the start, I was when I first started to think about it, my movements are a little bit different. And that's going to create different stress points left and right. So, yeah, systems check, get a feel for what and how you're doing what you're doing, and at least if you can try and keep some symmetry of time and timing, that's probably a good place to start. Yeah, awesome. Leave those headphones behind. <laughs> Yeah, for, no, for this session. For this, for this session, yeah, for this <laughs> one, yeah. But it, yeah, and it's good. It's handy. It's handy to listen sometimes. Like it's a really easy thing to use. Where you go, does it sound the same? You know, like you can often hear differences um, if if you start to question it or if you start to actually, you know, be a little bit more mindful of it. You can actually start to hear it, and then you go, okay, well, what is it that's happening? If you have a uterus or know anyone that does, then you need to listen to this episode with Dr. Stacey Sims. We dive deep into hormones, nutritional and training considerations during menstruation, perimenopause, what is amenorrhea and how eating times affect hormones and recovery and, of course, your adaptations from the gym. Um, But What is one thing that women can start doing now to create a healthier cycle and training relationship tracking their cycle and eating around training those are the two big things <laughs> those are the two biggest things that women can do to improve their health and their adaptations Amazing. there are many aspects of how to perform at your best in this episode i chat with neuroscientist strength coach and psychologist julia air We get into the mental side of performance, performing under pressure, dealing with the upsets and setbacks and building self-awareness around your own physical, mental and emotional health. We look at the different coping strategy 
strategies you can incorporate into your routine to manage disappointment, negative self-talk, stress, performance anxiety, and really anything that impacts your performance and well-being. This is Julia Eyre. What is your message to athletes who want to absolutely perform at their best mm-hmm. but um, are struggling with the mental side of things? I mean, we've spoken this uh, hugely around this mental aspect. Um, how do we know that we are struggling mentally? What can we do to then get on top of that? Um, so if you think about your brain as like a certain amount of real estate and just kind of map it out as I have this amount of square meters, make a list of how you actually fill up those square meters. Like what's taking up the most space. Imagine if it's exams and it's taking up, you know, a quarter of the space, girlfriend is taking up a 10th of the space, family is taking up, you know, half of the space and sports is taking up another 10% of the space. And what do you have left? Right. It's going to look different for everybody. And somebody who's really stressed out or struggling with whether it's physical or mental injuries or trauma or simply just a mental health down uh, moment, it happens also. Everything's in flux. We have good days and bad ones and good weeks and bad ones. But map that out and then see what you can reduce. Because the more mental real estate you can get, the less stressed out you are going to be as well. See what you can actually delete, see what you can reduce, spend more time on, spend more mental real estate on. And then try to actually implement that in your real life. Like, don't just reduce it on that piece of paper where you say I have a hundred square meters, but also be like, I'm actually just going to train three days a week instead of five, or I'm actually going to take this week off, or I'm going to push this exam to next semester, or I can't change anything. um, But I can adjust my expectations to know that this is only going to be this way for two weeks and not six months or two years, something like that and then have an end date for some of those things. So you at least know at the end of the day, my mental real estate will be more and I'll have more space to work with. So, you know, on this specific date and then date those things as well. If there's things that just cannot be changed, will never be changed, uh, don't have an end date on them. Or even if they do, I can never like recommend professional help, whether that's the health of a psychologist, sports psychologist, or a psychotherapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, go talk to somebody. (laughs) Like there are a thousand other skills. I've only given a couple here, but there are a thousand million trillion skills. And they're always specific to um, the person that we're working with. And really important to say also like two heads are better than one. Like, it seems like really dumb, but the more people you have working with you, that's the reason why we function better in teams and sports. And that's why even like individual athletes have multiple trainers, an athletic coach, a doctor, a physio that travel with them. Yes. You might be the one who's performing, but everybody else around you is making sure that you can. So if you are struggling, get the right people in the boat with you, get the right people on the team with you to like, kind of help lift you up and make sure that other people are advocating for and with you and looking out for and with you. Um, you don't have to do it by yourself. So yes, the mental real estate thing is really great, but never be afraid to like reach out and ask somebody for professional help because build your team. You have full capacity and full ability and also partially the obligation to build your own team. Um, Even if you've been given one, if it's not adequate for you, then find the one that works and take responsibility and let other people advocate for yourself so we can also advocate for you. Breathing, the key to staying alive. But the problem is, well, a lot of us don't do it properly. In this episode, I chat with David Jackson, better known as Jacko, and we dive deep into the biochemistry and biomechanics around breathing, the importance of carbon dioxide, why we need it, and ultimately how building your tolerance to it will improve your performance proprioception of the of the trunk is typically difficult and there's a lot of often people there'll be a bit of um miscommunication from the brain of and feeling of what you feel of like abdominal muscles and the diaphragm like the abdominal muscles being on the the outside the diaphragm being you know much deeper inside and actually if you were to do a um, if i asked you to like tense your diaphragm 
contract your diaphragm. If you tense your bicep, you know how to do it. They say, tense your, tense, your, uh, tense your diaphragm. It's like, what do people do? Typically, like, we'll tense our abs. And it's like, well, tensing your abs isn't your diaphragm. If, if I ask you to put your hands on your, your abdominal muscles and then do a strong mouth exhale, <sighs> what tenses when you do a strong exhale? Your abs. Your everything. Abs, yeah. Everything, yeah. So torso. your abdominals tensing, yeah, they're, they're, they're pulling the ribs down and in for the exhale. We know that the diaphragm contracts on an inhale. So it can't be that same sensation. Um, the diaphragm contracting on an inhale, we can um, help to feel what that muscle contraction is like by doing like simplest of anything is always like an isometric contraction. So we get, what we're going to do is put your hand, find where your lowest, your lower two ribs are and the angle where they meet underneath your sternum, put your hand there. That's sort of where the diaphragm is going to sit. And then do a normal breath in and normal breath out, pinch the nose, but then whilst you're holding your breath, try and breathe in and you'll feel underneath where that hand is like your diaphragm is trying to pull down there you go you're like yeah you can tell when <laughs> someone's great. belly's like crack it feels weird but it's like your diaphragm's trying to pull down but you're holding the breath so you're not letting it pull down so it's like trying to jump out of you it's trying to go somewhere but you feel it pulsing and that's similar it feel it's, it's not your abs but it's in a similar area so it gets confused for some people a lot of the time and that was a big game changer for me to answer that question of like Am I diaphragmatic breathing? How, how do I know if I'm using my diaphragm? It's like, well, try this. And you're like, oh, that's my diaphragm. It's like, well, now next time you take a breath, just try to correct, connect to that same sensation, but just let the air come in rather than hold the breath. That like, is okay. sensational. That is the best thing that I've ever, <laughs> ever done. I've never done that before. And holy, oh. sh of course, it's a game changer. It, so easy. It hey. gets that connect yeah. brain body connection. The unit training method follows meticulously structured cycles which lead members through three different phases, each with different goals, and their system is the same that athletes use to achieve the best results. With over 20 years combined experience, Matt Hunt and Alex Menchin know how to get the best from their members. In this episode, we chat about the best ways to get back into the gym after suffering COVID, the mistakes people make getting started on their fitness journey, how to overcome mindset blocks, the non-negotiables on nutrition, and the one thing that you need to stop doing right now. What do you guys think is important for people to understand about their training and training progress? that it should always be with longevity in mind that you should just be wanting to be able to do this in 50 years time i think for me it's the why the reasons why you're doing the things that you do um see yourself a goal and there's a long-term goal there's a short-term goal but along the way there will be some stuff ups there will be some good days some bad days some bad weeks it's okay, but there's a why, there's, there's a reason why you want to do it. I think there's a really nice saying um, that a lady put up on Instagram the other day, and it's um, be stubborn with your goals, but flexible with your approach. Oh, and, I like that. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Uh, she's a very wise lady. Um, but, yeah, you need to, with your why or with your reasons or where you're going, you know where you want to go, but um, life happens, so you've got to be... exactly journey will not be easy or linear or yeah no. all that stuff Nothing is. Yeah. Sarah Walsh was born with fibula hemimelia which led to her right leg being amputated below the knee when she was 18 months old at 10 years of age whilst watching other para-athletes compete at the 2008 Beijing Paralympics it was then that she decided she would one day compete and represent Australia at a Paralympics. And eight years later, she's achieved that goal. We chat about Fibula Hemimelia, her love of sport growing up, her dream to become a Paralympian, her passion to get better for Paris, and the importance of people with disabilities being at the forefront of mainstream media and getting the representation and equality they deserve. 
What is your message to young athletes who feel different from others who want to play professional sport and become a professional athlete? I guess it's just never let anyone tell you that you can't do something because you're different. If you want something so much, you want to play professional, you want to put on the green and gold, or you want to put on your local club's colours and go out there and throw a footy or whatever it is with your team and your friends, like, do it. Don't let someone tell you, oh, you've got one leg, you can't do that. Show them that you can. I guess for me, I've worked so hard my entire life to prove to people that despite having one leg, I could do that or I could be the best athlete in the world. And like I've had so many incredible people support me along the way, but it's also been a lot of my own drive and determination to want to be the best. And so I've never once let anyone who may have sat on the sidelines who may have doubted whether I could get to a Paralympics or get to a world championships or win a medal at a world championships. I've never let what they've said to me, like take me back and maybe think that maybe I couldn't do that. If anything, I've kind of used it as a driving force, like having that doubt in someone's mind, you kind of want to prove to them that you can do it. So no matter what, no matter what your dream is, no matter what your goal is, never let anyone tell you that you can't do it. Just show them that you can. Toxic internal chatter, unhealthy eating habits, body image dysmorphia. These are all issues each of us will experience or have experienced at some point of our life. Some more than others, but it's the actions you take, external environment you put yourself in, the support network you surround yourself by, and the commitment to making positive change that will help prevent these thoughts and habits from wreaking havoc in your life. That's why I love Tara LeFerrera. She is real and unfiltered and calling out the BS in the fitness industry because, as you probably know by now, there is a lot of it. We talk about navigating social media BS, setting goals that are specific to your needs that feel good, the mindset shifts that you need to adopt to overcome your fears of stepping into the gym or more specifically the weights area and building the confidence to show up for yourself. For those tempted or triggered by the eight-week bikini body challenge or the lemon detox tea for weight loss Mm -hmm. and skinny shakes and all the other shit out there, what can we do to refocus ourselves on what is right for our body and our minds and our health my thought with that is going back to what we first talked about how is it going to make you feel really and truly like you set out to do this okay try it for one day try it for one hour i don't know if you know this about me but i did the lemonade detox tea but i like um you know the 10 day fast like like way back in the beginning of my journey I lasted like four hours. <laughs> I felt <laughs> terrible. And then I went to go get a cheesecake because I was like, and then I felt worse. And then I just like, there's so many shitty things, but go into it and try it. And then notice how you feel. I actually, sometimes I'm like, yeah, okay. See how it feels for you. Because you know that it's not going to feel good. You know, deep down inside that this is not going to make you feel better. It's going to make you feel worse. And even though you think that because you want to be a smaller size to fit in the bikini or the dress or whatever, that's not who you are. And that's not going to make you feel better about yourself. It's going to make you feel so much worse. So um, try to stay stay clear of them. There's so many incredible people online that can push you the other direction and that can guide you into feeling just the most powerful, beautiful human that you can be and just really trying hard not to fall for all of the products out there that make you feel like a smaller or lesser version of you. You deserve the world and the world is not made from detox teas. (laughs) And that is a wrap on the ultimate episode part one for season three. Tell me which advice or guest do you you love the best or that you got the most from or that you've taken action straight away and 
have felt the absolute benefits from it and it's making massive positive changes in your life, I would love to know. I really would because listening back over those for me was just extraordinary and it's so good to listen to things, especially the positive stuff because I feel like generally we get the not so good stuff, maybe the negative things coming up in our, whether it's our phone feeds and social media feeds and screens and whatever it is it's it's the not so great stuff that we get over and over again so it was so nice for me to look back on all the amazing things from all the amazing guests that I've had the opportunity to speak with and reiterate these really really positive healthy habits so I would love to know what has been the most positive or influential advice that you've adopted or that you will adopt in your life um, that has either helped you or that you're looking forward to because I would love to know. Have the best day and week. Stay awesome and we'll come at you next week with part two of the ultimate tips episode. Mm -hmm.